Hi, uh, my name is uh, Bruce Ashfield and I am talking today about uh, binary artifacts and the ease of use um, on ramp for the Octo project. Um, I have done this present parts of this presentation in the past with uh, Mark Hatley. So I want to give credit to the inputs that he's given to that. We just weren't quite organized enough to do, uh, to get both of us uh, presenting uh, this time around. Um, a little bit about myself. I am um, one of the maintainers of um, the, the Octo project uh, through various components. I take care of um, uh, the reference kernel uh, as well as the meta virtualization, which is containerization and um, uh, traditional virtualization technologies. I've been around for about 10 years. And um, recently I've been doing more work uh, around the binary outputs of the Yocto project and trying to make things a little bit more reusable and, 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 and work on that, that on-ramp that is mentioned in my title. Um, so what I wanna cover today is uh, you know I'll, I'll do in a, a level set. Uh, I'll talk about the use cases that we are trying to solve. Um, I will go over some of the uh, technology that underpins um, the ability to do binary outputs and binary, binary artifacts in the Yocta project. I won't go into a lot of detail on each one of those because there's other talks that have been done in the past that cover them um, in much better detail by people that probably uh, know them better. And then I'll do some examples, a quick demo and, and future work. Uh, so what I'd like everybody to get out of this presentation is to um, understand and get an introdu introduction to the various binary artifacts produced by the Octa project and open embedded. Uh, I want to just do that exploration so you'll know what to look for um, in the plumbing of um, uh, the binary outputs of the project. And I want to show how uh, ease of use and uh, open embedded in the Yocto project are not mutually exclusive. So first of all, I like to start with uh, a little level set on the definitions because everybody has something um, different in mind when they hear binary artifacts and ease of use. So for our purposes in this presentation, when I say binary artifacts, uh, I'm talking about the outputs of a defined build that can be used or installed on a running target or to construct a target image. Um, the architecture, the optimization and different settings like that are defined by the build parameters and can impact the level of reusability. Uh, in, in particular, uh, we work with at Xilinx, a lot of ARM platforms. So they have uh, some different challenges in that, you know, the instruction and optimization techniques can vary between platforms and that a level of optimization does conflict if you have a high priority goal of uh, running common or generic binaries. So that's uh, binary artifacts. Um, ease of use um, in the sense, it should be obvious and clear how to complete at least the initial steps towards a goal. Um, meaning you wanna build an image, you wanna boot an image, uh, you want to update a package, it should be pretty obvious how to do that. And if it isn't, well, then you've, you've got a barrier to entry and, and that's what we're looking to address. Uh, the details of you know, how to do those things can vary by the use case. Also for ease of use, uh, we've thrown in that transitioning between use cases is supported and documented. And you'll see in some of my slides later why that's an important addition to ease of use in this scenario. So I always do a little talk about you know um, some common questions and, and comments that we get when talking about open embedded and, and, and the Octo project. Things like, um, you know, are binary packages supported? Uh, do you always have to start building from source? You know, are these binary outputs that you finally produced, are they compatible with third party packages? Um, whether it be from another distribution or some other build or some other process, you know, are they fully optimized for platform X or software stack Y? Um, you know, and then uh, after you get into it, it's a little bit of you want to pull the curtain to find out, you know, what is behind um, the binary artifacts, you know, um, and, and, and what does that? Um, you know, we'll point out here that it's, you know, open embedded core and the ecosystem metadata, the recipes and the configuration that is behind those uh, binary outputs. 
um, and it's not the sources of other distributions or base um, binary package feeds from other distributions. So in this sense, you know, what I'm talking about are binary artifacts that are built from open embedded and its ecosystem, not grafting in from other sources. Um, another question that we get are, you know, can I apt DNF update my target? Um, can things like Docker build work against these outputs? You know, and of course, a, a big one is uh, why would I use uh, the Yocto project binary artifacts versus um, distro X? And there's many more. I don't plan on answering all of these questions <laughs> exactly um, during this presentation, but I wanted to throw these are some of the the concepts and the ideas that are where I'm looking to explain um, and answer. You know, in particular, that last one, it really is, uh, you know, why would you use the Octo project uh, binary artifacts versus distro X? That really does come down to a lot of different reasons. And there's been other presentations on just this topic at past embedded Linux conferences and, and, and very other various other forums. I tried to throw together a little bit of a sort of chart um, representation of these sliding scales of uh, difficulty. It, it's not completely per perfect as I like it, but what this is trying to show you is, you know, whether you are building from source on the, the bottom or binaries on the top, and then this left and right axis, it's uh, sort of easier and harder. So. You know, it depending on again, it, it matters. You know, what's your point of view? Are you a developer? Are you a user? Are you trying to do production and and, and commercially supported um, products? So you know what your use cases are vary by your point of view, and then they will have a sliding scale of whether maybe binaries are easier place to start, source is an easier place to start, and then how hard or or easy they are. Um, and of course, there's these are not precise. There's all kinds of different shades of, of, uh, of gray that aren't shown on this slide. So for example, you know, if you want to do extended or SDK or produce SDKs, maybe that's easier if you start from source uh, than if you're going from binaries. License compliance, again, might be easier if you start from source uh, and build from sources rather than starting from binaries. But uh, you'll see later on in my presentation that we're doing work around binaries and license compliance that are built from the Octa project to hopefully, you know, make that a little bit easier. Anyway, so I won't go through all these, but, you know, optimization level, container builds, reuse, it all, um, depending on what you are, where, what, what your point of view is and what you're trying to produce, um, you, you, the difficulty will slide around uh, on the scale between binary and uh, source-based builds. Another question or represent, attempt uh, to represent the same sort of concepts or decision points is, you know, this slide about uh, is a binary distribution appropriate? Can you reuse parts of other builds directly without needing to start your own builds? So, you know, in this case, these are the different points of view, right? You're an IT or an application developer in the green box on the lower left, and you're doing a customized, optimized, device-specific, um, uh, distribution uh, in the top right. And in the middle, you're, you, obviously you're somewhere in the middle between the two. So um, in, in the green, you know, if you're doing an application developer or sort of a traditional enterprise uh, deployment, you know, really you can use a binary distribution because you are not um, modifying the base parts of the operating system and the distribution at that level. If you're doing partial customization, you might uh, be able to use a binary distribution, or you might be able to use parts of a binary distribution, as long as the tooling has a way for you to graft your own customizations into uh, that binary distribution starting point. And of course, if you uh, are doing a customized, optimized uh, device specific, then really you can't particularly use somebody else's binary distribution, you could certainly create your own. And the overlap in these squares shows that, of course, there are um, areas of uh, gray or, or uh, decision points where, yeah, you might be able to use parts uh, and you could slide between the different use cases. All right, so at that point, this point, you know, what we've established is there's, you know, various use cases and points of view for binary artifacts. You might, and you might not be able to, um, reuse somebody else's binary build. 
Um, and the, but the question is, okay, so what would we consider our binary artifacts out of the Octo uh, project? So Open Embedded and the Octo project has a, a long history with binary artifacts. Maybe a lot of people don't know, or maybe a lot do. Um, but the point is that they have been part of uh, the project for a significant amount of time. And some of the example binary artifacts would be um, you know, either the, the build appliance images or uh, some of the containers that are able to do builds and that are output from the, the Octa project. Um, the build tools, um, the, which is an SDK to augment older hosts. We have tool chains. And of course, what everybody normally thinks about when they talk about binary artifacts, which is the BSB and machine artifacts, whether it be um, device tree blobs, uh, bootloader kernel images, uh, and these different things for testing. These are things that are produced um, that are available today from various Yocto project uh, servers and components. And so what the binary artifacts uh, in the Yocto project are uh, designed to do, they're, they're designed to support either complete reuse, a bit of customization or total customization. And you should be able to slide between these different scenarios. Uh, one thing that I'll point out is, and I'll talk about a little bit more before I, I close the presentation, is that uh, you know a work in progress uh, that we're looking at right now is sort of a, a reference um, binary feed um, for those that do not need to customize the base or the standard packages, or, or I guess as well for anybody who wants to embrace and extend some of the base um, uh, packages. So a sort of tested reference uh, set of feeds that we know will work. And, and that they can be reused by those that want to get a quicker start. So that's great with the, um, the, the you know, those are the components that are sort of output as binary artifacts uh, from the Octo project. So the inputs, so how do you, you know, th that can make them different or make them vary that you have to pay attention to, of course, is um, the build configuration, um, you know, your machine, um, and some of the local settings, the, the layers that you use, which makes different sets of packages and um, uh, different packages and configurations available, as well as your site and local con configuration. So that would mean your distribution, your site.conf, your, your, your local.conf, where you can change the, the attributes of the build, which can produce different types of, uh, or modifications to the output packages. So in particular, in site and local configuration, if you are looking to generate a reusable binary feed of some sort, you need to minimize the types of configurations you do there to make them more broadly usable and hence more appropriate for sharing. Um, what you get for outputs, you know, some of them, some of the binary artifacts, you might not even be able to see. They're, they're internal to the build, they're internal to the process, they're internal to advanced configurations, and others, they are user visible in this list. Um, one thing that we would, that I would consider a binary artifact would be the shared state, which you can think of as a, a build cache. Um, there's hash equivalency, which works with shared state in order to promote cache reuse by calculating hashes on the inputs to know if an existing S state object can be used to accelerate a build. There is the PR service, which is the package uh, revision service, and that is available. It works in coordination with all the rest of these um, components to manage your package upgrades by producing an auto incremented revision, and hence you'll have a linearly increasing package number and your package manager can see a newly modified built updated package as um, a new upgrade and, and, and pull it in that way. We have, and those are all largely behind the scenes. Now we get into some of the more visible ones, which would be, you know, the package feed, which would be, uh, could be the package manager of your choice, whether it be DEB, RPM, IPK, and of course, non-OS components, bootloaders, DTBs, firmware can all be built from um, the same build, the Octa project. Um, we have, uh, you know, you might have pre-built images, which would be starting points for somebody, which would be download and run. And something that we work on in meta virtualization would which be OCI um, images, which are open container initiative images. Uh, so you can run and deploy uh, those types of those outputs and artifacts as well. An example of what 
you know, the different users of Open Embedded and the Yocta project and the ecosystem uh, where I work at Xilinx, you know, what we provide would be uh, some of these binary distribution artifacts of part of our build and release process, which would be, you know, we release the system configuration, which is the build scripts, the layers and, and components like that that are used for setup. Um, we also have intermediate artifacts, which would be the shared state and the various other uh, components to allow builds on top of what we've done. We release uh, DTBs, we have um, WIC images um, and the scripts that create them. And of course, we also produce SD card images, ESDK and SDK. So we provide SD card images so you can get started and boot quickly. And we provide uh, SDKs so you can either um, build applications or you can customize those base images. And none of these are perfect, uh, but it shows that, you know, there's various levels of leveraging and reuse of the um, binary distribution capabilities of the Octa project, uh, depending on what part of the ecosystem and what um, uh, vendor you're working with. One thing that, you know, since I've been contributing and working on the Octa project and others have seen as well, is that the use cases of building embedded, quote unquote, embedded Linux have changed over time. Um, and one of the things is we are running into more generic images, more application developers, more um, software stacks that are deeper and don't need that visibility into the lowest levels of the operating system at the beginning. So the big thing is in that case with involving use cases like that is we want to hide uh, the learning and complexity curve until it's needed. You know, the, there's things behind the scenes that are solving problems you might not know you have yet when you're deploying a Node.js application or you're doing a Go build, for example. There's dependencies, there's reproducible builds, there's licensing, but you don't really need to see that immediately uh, just to get started. We're also running into heterogeneous systems. So we are running into more systems that have uh, a mix of Linux, um, our tosses, they have firmware, they have MCUs, and to have, we need to have the ability to build um, for those types of systems. Also, we're, there's more and more demand for more than just images that you can flash onto an SD card and boot. So we have things like um, containers, you know, binary deltas, which I'm implying there would be the various different types of over the year updates and management of a target. We have um, deeper software stacks. We have multiple flavors of Kubernetes, you know, full Kubernetes, K3S uh, available that you can deploy software that way. And of course, um, building really small microservices with uh, the Octa project so you can uh, deploy them that way. We're also running into that merging and blending of embedded Linux, uh, increasing in complexity and enterprise um, Linux distributions coming down to maybe smaller slash you know, edge systems. So you end up with blended um, features from the two. So you, know, we, you want more um, than a package installer. You want accelerated containers that can make use of hardware assist to do AI, image processing, um, different things like that. We want potentially safe and secure containers um, through technologies like RunX, uh, leveraging Zen and a, and, a, and a componentized system. We want low footprint runtimes on both as an example, so we can bring up the density of the services on a smaller device. And you know, we want more maintenance and in-service upgrades versus again, back to more than just a flashed image. So the big thing is between these different use cases is the, the mobility between them is important. So, you know, is there a defined and structured way to change your use case? So the, the, the way that these are enabled needs to be the same for all of the different use cases, but yet uh, is available only when you need it. You shouldn't have to dive into multi-config um, to do your heterogeneous system until you know you need it, for example. Another 
important thing, and this goes to the hidden capabilities that are that you shouldn't have to worry about um, until you need them. So you know, beyond packages, uh, things to consider. Um, will you need to do reproducibility, reproducible builds? Um, this is a core Yocto project capability, uh, and you can check out the details at reproduciblebuilds.org. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of the work that has been done for reproducibility, of course, also leads into more efficient binary artifact building with um, hash, um, estate reuse, and, and, and different components like that. Licensing, um, SBOM also are you know that you may need to do to consider more than just producing by binary packages so that is also a core capability and there's multiple ways if you've built from open embedded core or the octa project that you could consume those outputs and accompany it and accompany your uh, binary uh, deliveries you know, customization um, you need to how would you if you need to modify a package in some way is there a streamlined way besides pulling the source onto your target, configuring and building? How do you customize the target? What level of customization? Um, will you get support from the ecosystem if you've modified, extended, or used them directly? You know, what, is, what is the way that you can get help, whether it be in the community or commercially, if you've modified or extended uh, packages? How can you extend a platform? Is it possible? Or do you have to start from scratch? You should also be considering both application and system developers. Don't, if you cater to uniquely one or the other, you'll either be too simple or too complex. And having a system that can support moving between the two is, is, is absolutely uh, important. And then of course, the typical, what are you gonna do for support maintenance and updates once you've done your first uh, binary build or reused a binary package feed from somebody else? And over the years, one of the things that we've noticed that when you, you, when you add some of these capabilities or these concerns to your traditional distros or enterprise distros, you know, it can be a little bit ad hoc or maybe you don't follow the guides directly and it can result in something that's potentially less structured than what you get out of the Yocta project. So at that point, if you look at the learning and complexity curves, no, they're roughly similar. So the, 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 the comment that um, the Octo project in open embedded is hard or is complex, uh, it tends to blur. So you, you need to view the complexity through um, the things that you need to consider um, after you've built the packages. What I wanted to do uh, for about the next, I don't know, five, five, five or 10 minutes, would be to uh, go over and do a little bit of a demo um, image uh, with a package feed. Um, there's been other uh, demonstrations of this in the past, um, but I wanted to throw it in here to show that the stuff that I'm talking about is, um, uh, is available and it does work. I'm not going to do most of it fully live because the, the build server that I have available can take two to three minutes per um, some of the operations. So um, it takes a little bit too long to fit into our allotted time. But what I would like to cover first is that, you know, what I've done um, uh, for this build is, 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 is cloned um, um, the Octo project or, or Pocky um, reference distribution. I'm using the minimal, the minimal image that is part of OE core um, slash, you know, Pocky. And I've done, I've configured that image for uh, package management, system D, and I'm using it for the base, the base image. Um, I'm going to show package management, uh, DNF in this case, because we're I'm building the default, which is RPMs, commands on target. I will show how you know we can add packages to the feed after you've done your initial build, how we can install uh, and upgrade those same packages on the target. And then I'm gonna throw a little bit of something new that's maybe not quite as commonly demonstrated. Um, I'll show a little bit about our capabilities with meta virtualization and those types of uh, binary outputs and show how I can, on that same running image, I can add uh, Docker. Um, you could use Podman or some of the other available runtimes that we have. Uh, we can add those dependencies onto the target. 
I will show how we can create a simple base container image, push that image to a registry and then pull and run uh, that same image uh, onto the target. So I've captured in the slides an abbreviated set of details so they could sort of be used as a reference uh, because it's hard to show it all in the, the demo. So you know, here's a little bit how what I cloned and a little bit of the configuration that I mentioned in my summary. I've, 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 I've enabled system D, um, we have, you know, uh, and uh, SSH so I can get into the target. I've also added a little bit of extra space because Docker and some of the other builds we'll be doing actually need a fair bit of storage. The only other things of interest in this configuration, you can see where I have set um, the package feed URI to, which is the IP address of my build host in this case. Um, you would set that to whatever your build, or you could actually set it on the target after you've booted. Um, also, there's other various configurations where you can use a remote or a shared package feed coupled with shared S state, PR server, and hash equivalency. There's lots of complex and different types of configurations you can do. I'm using basically the simplest. So in order to, you know, to get this started, I, I bit bake core image minimal. On my builder, it takes a little while, so we're not going to do that. Uh, I already have it, uh, this base image uh, with what is in core image minimal built, and then you bit bake uh, package image, sorry, package index. And that goes through and it creates uh, what is needed by the, the, whatever your packaging system is in order to create the binary feed uh, to be served to the system. And then you need to have some sort of uh, HTTP front end to serve those uh, packages. So on, in my example, I'm just using the built-in Python uh, web server and I've gone to temp deploy and started um, that server and then uh, booting the target. Once the target is up and running, um, you can see that it's a, it's a recent build um, from last week of 5.13.12 and that we initialize DNF by running DNF make cache. And that goes through, it will contact the package server, it will create the, you know, the default database, and then we can um, search to see what is available on the target. And in, in my example, I've gone through, I've uh, searched for BusyBox. Uh, you can see that um, you know, it is available, there's different versions, it's installed in, in all of the different utilities. And I've searched for uh, Docker in this example, and it is not currently even available in the package feed. So that's something that I'm uh, in the demonstration that we can go back to our build host, add it to the package feed, and it will appear. Uh, here's an example as well, uh, something even simpler than adding Docker because it builds quite a bit more dependencies is that say we wanted to add Vim to core image minimal because it's not available or it's got the built-in uh, BusyBox uh, VI and, and you want something a little bit um, more elaborate. So, you know, we can go back to the build host, we could bit bake Vim, it will build Vim and all the dependencies and then re-bit bake the package index. Um, on the target, you would refresh your caches. You can search for Vim, see that it's available, DNF install Vim, and as you'd expect, we get about 23 megabytes of uh, downloaded packages, and Vim is now available in your package feed and it is installed on your target. Um, the transition to make that permanently part of any new images, you would go through and do the normal uh, define a distro and an image, and you could make it always built and installed um, in the future if that's that's what you want to do. But I my demos are all about adding um, packages to um, a running image without needing to reflash and restart the entire image. Uh, this is a this this part of uh, the demo um, is showing how we can use the PR service to. Uh, trigger a package upgrade um, on the target. So in this case, I'm trying to run expand, which is not available in uh, this busy box based image. Um, so we get command not found. So if we go to the build host and we add config expand uh, to the busy box uh, configuration, 
we would do a bit bake on BusyBox. And the, as mentioned, the S state, the hash equivalency, and the PR server would um, figure out the signatures, see that this is a new configuration of the package, and it would produce an updated um, revision to the package so that it would be available as an upgrade. So once I bit make BusyBox and redo the package in index, you can see that I now have a BusyBox 1.34 and dot dash r 0 0.3. I had a couple of iterations. The dot x is what is increasing by the, the PR service. So we now have a 0 0.3 RPM available. Uh, back on the target, if we redo the, the make cache to check with that package feed, I can do a DNF upgrade on BusyBox. It sees that 0 0.3 is available. Um, I install it and of course now I have expand available. So that was all managed through all of the plumbing that you don't need to know about it immediately, but you know that if you do customize the base image, you can have it flow into the package feed. And that same theory holds if you're using a base package feed from somewhere else, but you have access to a shared PR server, estate, and various of the internal artifacts, you could um, rebuild BusyBox and have your own extended binary show up in the package feed as uh, a newer version and supersede what you were initially uh, handed in that base image or package feed. So this demo um, is again a little bit more complex and I didn't build it because there is a little bit more to the rebuild. In this case I've added meta virtualization, meta security, and meta open embedded uh, to my build. I've added the virtualization and set comp feature to the distro, and that triggers a bit more uh, of a rebuild than, than we'd have time to sit through. Um, and I've and, and once all that is configured and in, I've I've bit baked the, the Mobi version of Docker that is available. Um, and a note that I'll put here is this actually rebuilds uh, the kernel because of the virtualization features. It adds some of the different configurations that you would need for proper Docker, Docker operation on the target. So you're either going to need to do a DNF kernel update, which is one of the things we're looking at. It still may or may not have issues, or you may you will need to rebuild the whole image and start over. Um, so you bit big Docker, Mobi, the kernel, all this dependencies get built. And again, as I've been doing all the way through this, we bit bake package image. And then you have the two options. Are you going to rebit bake um, core image minimal? or option B uh, that I did is I did a DNF upgrade on the kernel. It pulled in the new kernel um, and the, the dependencies for headers and various things. And then I shut down uh, QEMU to make sure that we would reboot with the, with the new kernel. So in this case, I, I think I might actually attempt to show some of this live. If it fails, uh, we will go back to the reference slides. Um, so in this case, I have the um, the build that I've been doing uh, that I've been using uh, to do to capture the output for these slides. So if I do the uh, run QEMU uh, that you see on uh, the the captured versions, we're booting that same image. So this is you know one that was built on Monday, August twenty third, and oh, we don't have. We don't have Docker available. So using the, the package feed and the various components that I, uh, I just built, we can do a DNF install Docker Mobi. Actually, before I do that, one thing that is interested to see is that, so we can show the difference. If we do a, a, a DNF, um, if we do a DNF list installed, kernel star, and we see how many there are for kernel packages on the target, you'll see that we have four. Um, and so after we do a DNF install Docker Mobi, it's going to download 236 package, 51 megabytes, and add two, so, uh, 200 and some megabytes to my image. So we get all of the IP tables, uh, dependency modules, we get a bunch of kernel modules. And in this case, we are going to get some util Linux um, individual packages to um, supersede uh, the BusyBox uh, built-in components. 
it does what you'd expect. It's contacted the, the, the package server. It's pulled in those plus the dependencies. It's running their install scripts on the target. And so in this case, we're taking care of everything from um, it's installing the package. It's running update alternatives to make sure these are pointed to instead of the busy box alternatives. And you know, generally making uh, the packages available. So it's you know we're again I'm throttled by the speed of my build server um, <laughs> versus how long this would take. Uh, this this would vary based on um, your and of course as these um, kernel modules are installed, we're also getting debt mod and and other um, installation post installation um, steps run to make sure it's available. And and one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, and I'll talk about briefly in a minute, is we're looking at making sure that those post install scripts and installation steps are tested and, and working consistently such that you can count on your package feeds being able to do um, things like this. So there, we're finally now to the point we, where we are installing um, Docker Mobi. We're verifying and we should be done very soon. All right, we are complete. So now if I rerun DNF list installed kernel, there's now 33 um, kernel packages that are available. So you could see it wasn't just Docker. We got a lot of the um, Docker components installed. So we do a system control stop Docker and we will then start uh, the Docker daemon. And due to the networking configuration of my build server, this can actually take up to two minutes to get sort of things started. So I will switch back to the slides while um, uh, while Docker is, is is busy starting up. So uh, I capture these commands. We don't need to go over them. We're starting. And so in this example, you could see. Um, you know, once Docker is up and running on the, um, once Docker is up and running on the, the, the target, we can see that it's 20.10.8, it was built recently, and that we can do a Docker pull on uh, BusyBox, which is the standard reference container from Docker Hub, and that I can run that BusyBox um, target, uh, sorry, container on, on our target without needing to do any modifications. You know, that's great that we can run a reference images from, from Docker Hub, but um, you might be more interested in um, being able to um, run your own container. So in this, in this example, it's again, a very simple example. There's something called container base and meta virtualization that's we're working on making more useful. If I bit make container base, that is the minimal sort of configure container configuration. It skips a kernel and some dependencies and, and puts a shell. Um, into the entry point. And it uses the image OCI backend of meta virtualization, and it creates an OCI container in um, temp deploy. So, you know, you bit the container base, it builds the container, builds the components, or reuses them in this case. Um, and then from our build host, we can use Scopio to copy it to, in this example, my uh, Docker Hub um, account. And we can, uh, it's something called container base. And then back on the target, I can do a Docker pull container base and it brings in um, the artifacts that I just built and I can run it just fine. I can drop into um, that container and it works just the same um, you know, as the BusyBox reference. And it was you know, completely built from um, open embedded, the Octa project, and of course, you now have the associated licensing and source information um, behind that container, if that's what you're using, because you can now use that as a base container for, uh, for other Docker builds um, and other reuse scenarios. I will quickly check to see if Docker wanted to um, start, and if not, we won't. Okay, so it is up and running, so we can do a Docker version and we can do that Docker pull on, uh, on, we can do a Docker pull on. When I ran, you can see using tag latest pulls the layer. And so I can do Docker run. 
and we drop it in the container and it's just exactly what you would expect. And then of course, you, at that point, you're free to do whatever you want. You can keep, can do, you can re-tag, push, um, and use a, a sort of a typical workflow to pull and update uh, the container. In closing um, to the presentation, I want to introduce this um, binary artifacts working group uh, that I'm helping to drive as part of sort of the medium to long-term planning in the, the Yaktu project. Uh, right now through the summer, it's been on about a monthly sync meeting. Um, it will get hopefully a little bit more um, frequent if needed uh, going through the fall. And that is a focus on code and tangible outputs. It's not just planning. Um, the goal is to actually to produce reusable <laughs> parts of the ecosystem. So in particular, we're looking at making sure the components that have always existed, making sure that there's good documentation around them, that the guides are easy to find, they're easy to follow, and that they work consistently. Um, to put some QA and some structure around that binary infrastructure so we can test and prove and know that it's working on sort of a nightly uh, base, uh, basis. We want to create a place for collaboration and technology sharing. It's all about embrace and extend. We are not trying to um, re-implement anything that we don't have to, whether it be configuration and setup, whether it be testing, whether it be the base configuration with the package feeds is not about uh, creating everything from scratch. Um, it is the overarching goal is to address that ease of use and on-ramp questions. How do you get started more quickly? Um, we want to unlock you know, the full potential um, and also to produce sort of this tested reference binary feed. As I mentioned, when I was going through my demo with attention to some of the upgrade paths and package management issues with the sharing of S8 PR server to making sure that they both scale and work consistency consistently and to produce some, uh, eventually some, maybe some reference containers and different types of um, binary artifacts that so people can test and use them quickly on different types of systems, whether they have or haven't been built from Open Embedded and Yocto. I will point out that the non-goal of the working group is to create a commercial and supported binary distribution or to replace existing Open Embedded based binary distributions. It's all about creating that reference and making sure that the underpinnings that are available to both Doctor project members and open embedded community members are working consistently and are working you know, as advertised. Um, if you're interested in binary artifacts or helping out in this effort, you, know, you can join, the, join open embedded um, or the Octa project and help us unlock uh, the potential of binary artifacts in, in these types of scenarios. And my final uh, thing is I will close with uh, sort of this future work slide. It's not, it's sort of what you would expect is to get up and running the reference distributions. There may or may not um, be that first package feed available by the time this presentation is um, viewed as part of embedded Linux, uh, but it won't be too far after. Um, we would like to produce some, maybe some pre-built images for or at least advertise the existing pre-built images uh, out of the, the, the auto builder or different infrastructures that are available. Um, and I said auto builder, but this is not tied into Yocta project infrastructure. It should be working on GitLab and various other uh, CI pipelines. We could potentially have some sort of installer. Go back to my, we're not looking to reinvent. Um, another thing would be to extend those reference feeds outside of OE core because a lot of the interesting packages and things that people would like to do are part of the Yocto project and open embedded ecosystem, whether it be open, open and meta open embedded or meta virtualization, security, um, some of the different layers. And of course, as I mentioned, something that I'm working on in particular is the reference based containers, both the pre-built variants and um, the recipes and base definitions to produce those containers so somebody can uh, do it on their own. And that is it um, for my uh, presentation.
I am now available for uh, questions if uh, we have anything that we'd like uh, to address. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope everybody got something out of uh, the quickly presented and broad ranging material uh, that I had.